So hello everyone. Um, today I'm covering a paper which presents a new technique to calculate gradients. Um, it's quite cool, but I think the paper itself is not that lengthy and there is not much that much to cover there. But to fully understand it, we I think we need to recap a few concepts uh, about gradient descent and automatic differentiation. So the first half of this talk will be about it. And only then I will move to the paper. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, let's start with an um, abstract problem. Suppose you have some function which depends on some variables and you want to find the minimum of this function and the variables coordinates which correspond to this minimum. This function might be your loss function in machine learning and your coordinates are weights. So yeah, you get the idea how the relates to our sphere, to our field. How can you do that? So in general, this function may be quite complex and it is not an easy task to analytically find the uh, global minimum of this function. However, we still have other algori algorithms like an iterative gradient descent. So suppose you have some coordinate on your function, you can calculate the value of the function in this point, and you can calculate the gradient. And once you know the gradient, you know how to update your coordinates in a way that the updated coordinates correspond to the lower value of your function. So by updating your uh, coordinates, your weights, step by step, you may hope that you may reach some uh, local minimum or global minimum. It depends on how lucky you are. Okay, we have this algorithm, gradient descent. It is iterative, so it can take quite some time to finish to find the global minimum. How can we improve? So there are different strategies. Uh, for example, you can try to make your each of your updates smarter by, for example, um, adjusting the update step by adjusting the learning rate. And that's what the grad um, algorithm is trying to do. Next, you may try to make a smarter update smarter to find the smarter direction of your update. Uh, for example, you can add some measure of inertia to your updates so that each new update is not solely defines your update. Each new gradient does not solely define your update, but it um, aggregates with the past gradients. And that's what momentum approaches are doing. Another strategy, since this thing is iterative uh, algorithm, you can try to make each of your iterations uh, faster. And since in each iteration you have to calculate the gradient, you may try to calculate your gradient faster. And that's what uh, the paper is presented, a new technique for. But before we get to that, how, what, how do we use gradients in machine learning in the first place? So you get the idea, they use the gradient descent. How do we calculate them? For that, we have automatic differentiation. It's a technique which allows you to calculate the gradient uh, value of some function and gradient of it. And it relies on the fact that complex functions like loss function, machine learning can be represented as a series of simpler functions for which you know uh, the derivatives. And so if you apply chain rule to your complex function, you may actually find the gradient with high precision. That's what automatic differentiation is doing. Now, to explain how it works, let's consider an example. For example, this function, uh, x, uh, y equals uh, x1, x2 plus sine of x1. So you can um, split this expression into different steps. For example, you can represent this multiplication as one step, uh, the sine function as another step, the summation as the third step, and so you can represent your function in a series of uh, computations. Okay, 
how do we calculate the gradient? Uh, automatic differentiation has two primary modes of operations. Uh, the one of them is called forward mode. It is easier. It is, it is easier to understand. It is faster. One, and it's what lies uh, in the basis of the paper I'm covering today. But it has its downsides. Let's try to understand how it works. If you don't understand how it works, don't worry. Um, and I'll give you some key notes about it. Okay, so in forward mode automatic differentiation, we start with setting some uh, initial conditions. So the coordinates we have serve as initial coordinates. And then we also have to set a C. Now I will get to C later for now, just except that we have to do it because this technique is calculating uh, the values. So to calculate the values, it needs to know some values. And those values are our seeds. We can get to it later. So we start with setting seeds. And then we start to unwrap our function from the beginning. So we start with this uh, operation W3, which is multiplication. Uh, the value of multiplication is easy to calculate. The derivative of calculation of multiplication is this thing. So far, so good. Right. Next, we go to W4. It's sine function. Value of sine function is this. The derivative of sine function is this. Okay. And finally, summation. We sum the results of W4 and W3 into W5. Quite simple. The derivative of summation is also known. Quite simple. Cool. So we calculated something. We calculated the value of the function, W5. This. And we calculated something, some value that corresponds to the derivative. Now let's take a look at what we got in there. Uh, so let's start with complexity of this uh, technique. So if you define runtime f as a time needed to calculate the value of your function, then forward mode is taken approximately three times of the time, or less. However, um, what we managed to calculate as a derivative is a single scalar value, and the gradient typically is a vector. So in a single pass, we managed to calculate some scalar, and this scalar is a single component of your gradient, which corresponds to x1, since we set the C by that. So to actually calculate the full gradient, you have to repeat this process a few times. Uh, in this case, you have to repeat it two times because you have only two variables. But in real conditions, you have your variables are weights, and you can have millions of them. So forward mode is not really useful for calculation of the exact gradient. Okay, next one, next one is reverse mode. So reverse mode is more complicated, but you can actually evaluate the whole gradient in a single pass. Let's take a look how it works. So any questions? And reverse mode starts with com computation of the value of your function. So you start with the coordinates and get the value. And then you again set seeds. This time you set seeds, you will bring your function from the end, so your seed is set in the end. We have an notation here. So a bar over some variable uh, means that it is joined. And a joint part means that it's a derivative of the final function with respect to the variable, which is joint. And in reality, we will be using this formula. It's the same formula as here, but we apply chain rule so we can uh, calculate each. Um, each joint either of them. Okay, so we computed the value of our function and we set C. Now, how do we find the gradient? 
once again, we unwrapping our function from the end. We have the amyloid point. We move to the amyloid four. The adjoint of the amyloid four. Uh, we can calculate the adjoint of the amyloid four using this formula. You can see here that it is a summation of over some successors of I. So the successors of uh, W4 are operations in which W4 can be encountered. In this case, if there is only one successor, it's W5. And the adjoint of W4 using this formula uh, is adjoint of W5 times uh, partial derivative of W5 or W4 partial derivative of this with respect to W4 is one. So far so good. Okay. Moving next, uh, we repeat the same for the joint of W3. So again, it is only encountered in W5. The joint of W3 is a joint of W5 times the derivative of the summation. This is one. Good. Next, moving to W2. So W2 has a single successor, W3. So the joint of W2 is a joint of W3 times the derivative of W3 uh, with respect to W2, which is W1. Okay. And finally, the last step, the joint of W1. So W1 has two successors, so we have two terms. We have to calculate two terms to calculate the full joint. We do that by uh, first finding a joint with respect to sine function. It is this. And, and the joint with respect to the multiplication is this. So in the end, we sum, sum those two terms and we get the gradients. So as you can see, we, we in the reverse mode, we managed to calculate both the value of the function and all the gradients yeah. of our function with respect to all variables. This is nice. So the complexity, oh my God, no. sorry. So the complexity of the reverse mode compared to the forward mode is greater. It takes more time to calculate, around five to 10 times the random. But as you have seen, we managed to calculate the full gradient in a single pass. So that is really nice. This is actually the technique used to calculate the updates in the propagation. I'm not sure maybe it goes up even the same things. Well, we are done with recap. Any questions here? Okay, so we know what is gradient descent is. We know what is automatic differentiation is. Let's move to the paper. So in the paper, way they the authors present a new way to calculate gradients, new technique to calculate it, called forward gradient. Uh, it is it is using forward mode of automatic differentiation, and that it estimates the gradient as this expression. Here, v is some random vector. It is each component of v is sampled from distribution with zero mean and unit values, some kind of Gaussian. Gaussian. Okay, we have an ex the expression. What does it actually mean? So they call it this thin gradient, and indeed we can see gradient here. But this thing, if you take a closer look, is a projection onto some random vector v. So I think that requires explanation how projecting a gradient onto some random vector actually gives us anything meaningful. Let's take a look at this process on on a plot. So suppose you have some function, uh, some coordinate, some function, it's going to plot like this. You have a point and you have a gradient of your function at this point, this big red arrow. Okay. And 
So let's consider some random vector V, for example, this one. Uh, as you remember, our forward gradient uses projection of the true gradient onto this random vector V. So if we do this, we will obtain the following vector. Big uh, green or orange. So, as you can see, our initial random vector V was not looking into the right direction. But after projection, we actually got some vector which is not exactly collinear with the two gradient, but it is looking in the right direction. So, technically, we can use it for this. Now, um, we know that it will work. How we can calculate it. So we uh, we can do it using forward mode. And as you remember, in forward mode, you have to set some seed. Uh, the number of seeds is the number of variables you have. So we argue that to calculate the gradient, you have to repeat this process a few times. But it is only true if you are using those seeds, one half seed, calculate one component of the gradient. If instead you conserve it, um, the values, the coordinates, the components of your random vector B as C. This still remains a valid problem for forward mode automatic differentiation. So you can use it to calculate your gradient. So um, there should be a comment here for those who don't know what's going on and are trying to learn from the slides is that uh, what forward mode AT calculates is Jacobian times our, our vector. What the reverse mode AD calculates is transpose of Jacobian times a vector. A vector is that seed value or V1, V2. And uh, if we have only one loss function, uh, then uh, our vector is one dimensional when we're doing back propagation because there is only one element that we can seed, and that's the one. Uh, but when you're doing forward mode, the number of inputs is your dimension of the vector that you multiply by. And uh, uh, so one way to think about this is Jacobian times a vector, but it's not intuitive. Everyone here took calculus, right? And everyone knows uh, what uh, directional derivative is. Derivative along some direction. Forward mode computes derivative along this orange direction of the slide. So once, and another comment here, uh, I don't know, maybe you, you can nicely follow those formulas uh, in red uh, on the right of the slide, but they're confusing because they are in the formula form. They uh, at least mi mislead myself as if they have some functional form. When you're computing a D forward mode or backward mode, each stage is an actual numerical number. Uh, it's a number of the machine precision of the value of the derivatives. So once you run forward AD, you computed that number that is a directional derivative along the along some direction. And when um, can you can you uh, scroll back to that expression uh, of yeah. uh, from the paper that you started with? Yeah, this one. Whatever is in parents is automatically computed by forward mode AD, the uh, gradient along a direction, and uh, then you just multiply by the same direction. What, which means is, okay, I know the gradient magnitude and I know the direction. Here's my vector along, uh, along this direction that results in the gradient. So it's very intuitive once you think about the directional derivatives. Thanks, Sergey. So we stop at this. We know that this forward gradient is somewhat correct. It will lead us in the right direction. And we can use forward mode to calculate it. The only thing we need that is left to prove is that this forward gradient is not biased, meaning that it will not lead us into some false uh, global minimum or some kind of minimum, but we will indeed lead us to the true minimum. We do that by doing a little math. So if you try to carefully express uh, each component of this forward gradient, you will get this expression. What does it have? It has a nice component of the gradient times some value, 
and it has um, black and the red end, which is not related, should not be here, but we still have it. So okay, this expression alone does not tell us much, but if we try to calculate the uh, expectation of this value, in the statistic, and if we remember that our vector v is sampled from a distribution with zero mean and mean variance, we may realize that this term is equal to one, and this term is equal to zero, since different components are sampled independently from each other. And so in the end, we have this, this term goes to zero, this goes to one, and we are left only with a nice component of the true gradient. So yeah, on average, our forward gradient will give us a good estimation uh, of the true gradient. Okay, that's established. How it compares to the black propagation gradient, which is uh, usually used to update weights. So black propagation relies on reverse mode. The complexity of the reverse mode is this. Uh, forward gradient is using forward mode ID. The complexity is this. And if we divide the second by the first, we will get um, a relative speed, relative complexity of the forward mode compared to uh, backward mode by propagation gradient. And a typical ratio of this value used in but propagation to this value using forward is around two. So in theory, we can expect that our forward gradient will be computed twice as fast uh, as back, back propagation gradient at the expense that this forward gradient is somewhat random. Let's see. So we have here, let's see how the case in real life. So the authors tested uh, back propagation with forward gradient on a few problems. A few baseline problems are uh, this, finding the global minimum of two functions. This one you already saw. This one um, is a Rosenberg function. This is minimum. This is its counterpart. Okay, so these are the problems. And here are the results. How do we read them? Let's take only one of them for now. So what did they do in those experiments is that they optimized this function using 1,000 iterations and two different algorithms for that. And from this figure, this plot, we see that both algorithms are optimizing this function equally well. So they don't really differ in the speed of optimization in regards to iterations. But since each iteration of the forward gradient is actually taking less time, we end up with this, that the forward gradient is finishing the optimization faster in real time. Not in iterations. Not in iterations. This plot basically highlights this. The forward move is using less time to compute 1,000 iterations. And this final plot is showing us how those updates look like uh, on the plane of this function. So the red line here is back propagation, and as we can see, it's very smooth. Mm -hmm. The blue lines are forward gradients, and you can see that they are some random stochastic, but yet in the end, they, they all lead us to the right direction. To the cloud. So these are results. Uh, the second baseline problem on, based on the, another function basically shows us the same picture. Uh, the two algorithms approximate this function equally well in with regards to iterations needed. But forward mode is doing it faster because each iteration is performed faster. And that's it. That's the kind of result we are going to see in every experimental problem. So next, they move to some more complex problem, the training of logistic regression, which has more variables than two. How many? 
I don't really know. Maybe thousand. But anyway, what can we see here is the same picture. Both algorithms optimize the loss equally well in iterations, but uh, forward gradient is doing it faster. And in this case, we can see that it's doing it almost twice as fast compared to back prop. So next, they consider uh, a deeper architecture with more weights. They have two rows here. They represent two kinds of results. Uh, on the upper results, they use the smaller learning rate. On the lower results, they use the uh, greater learning rate. Uh, so lower learning rate is showing us the same picture we saw before. Let's not consider it. The, Lower results, however, are showing us something more interesting. We can see that forward mode can manage to find a better minimum than by perturbation, probably due to the fact that it is stochastic and it managed to jump over some local minimum and the perturbation could. And once again, it is, um, it is working faster. All right. Next, they tested it on training the CNS. The results the same, I will skip it. And the final result, that's, that's good. Cool. The final result, and they uh, analyzed how those algorithms evolve with the increasing complexity of a model. So they took some MLP with variable number of players, and they saw how those algorithms became on different number of players. So there are two kinds, two, two results I want to highlight here. This one is showing us how the memory usage evolves uh, with the increase in complexity. And there is only one line here. So it means that both algorithms are using the same number, of, same amount of memory. On one hand, it is good because you can calculate, you can obtain your result, results faster using uh, the same amount of memory. On the other hand, it's bad because you will still be out of memory uh, from the today. And the second kind of results I'm showing here is this half. So it's it is showing us the evolution of a relative runtime cost with increasing complexity. So this line is below one, which means that forward gradient uh, keeps Stays in stays faster compared to back propagation gradient uh, in this whole range of layers. But as we can see, this line is approaching one with increasing complexity. So with uh, with deeper models, it appears that forward gradient is getting less efficient, but still it is more efficient than back propagation. Uh, so if you do how many repeats are they doing? What kind of repeats? Samples. Uh, does the number of samples depend on the complexity of the model? Maybe you need more samples for this to have the same convergence uh, for the forward. Forward mode is like hematizes, right? You have to sense multiple directions and then you kind of guess, okay, uh, the face is coming from that or like the the gradient is coming from kind of that direction. The higher the dimension, I would say, the more of those you need. So I wonder, did they, across all of these experiments, did they keep the number the same, 100, or the number is scaling with the complexity? And now we have like million, uh, million parameter network, we need k times 100, or we still keep 100. But I doubt that if you, like I'm, I'm thinking, if you still keep 100, then you will uh, stochastically wander much for much longer and maybe it won't be able to converge because the proof is only valid in the limit. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the expectation is in the limit. So I wonder how actually how many times you have to sample. And then after doing that, how many times you have to sample, I, like complexity grows each, each time, each direction, each forward, derivative has a cost. And if you have to do, run it multiple times, then 
you know, which you, the estimate times three times number of times you run, while by propagation is giving you the correct derivative all the time, correct gradient all the time uh, for the same cost. And I don't know when the cost starts to matter. Especially in CNNs with large activation functions, where um, each pass means a lot, but the gradients are small. Back propagation may not be as bad as the claim goes. So, uh, I'm not sure in theory, the forward mode and forward gradient should stay you know, twice as fast as the propagation around that. For one calculation. Yeah. And then you run it twice. And then you run it 10 times to get all of those directions. I think they're using only once. Then we have a problem. How many times you have to repeat? Uh, I suppose they're using the same number of directions on this once, but I'm not quite sure. Is they N? They resemble N time. Do they say? I don't know. I thought they said that. Okay. Well, it should be a, a, the gradient. Otherwise, it's like uh, restricted boson machine. Then, uh, like you're do, you're just doing one sample, right? If you look at your expression where you took expectation of uh, gradient times square and uh, interacting linear by linear interacting terms, this proof only holds when you have tons and tons of samples for one iteration. So are they taking just one sample for one iteration? But then you're kind of going the wrong direction sometimes, completely opposite to the gradient, but by a little bit. Well, if it's exactly opposite, then it will be zero. But I don't think uh, there, it's they, possible. They clarify. Uh, in order to have any chance of runtime advantage over back propagation, we need to work with a single run of the forward mode uh, per optimization iteration. So they are doing single run. Yes, one sample of whatever, yeah. So it is like my little friendly bacteria chasing the sugar uh, yeah. crystal in the animation. I see a lot of parallels between this and something like RBM or forward forward, but I only see that based on the idea of sampling from the, the vector. Uh, but this seems like a computer version of those. My opinion, though. Okay, I don't know what you No. Um, both of those other methods are trying to extract information based on some distribution of this vector v, whether it's the input or the output. And in this case, they're just sampling that v from some random normal distribution. I, I read a joke somewhere, um, sorry, just going on a tangent, but uh, when two statisticians uh, go to pick up mushrooms in the forest and get like lose each other, what do they do? They get drunk and start working in random directions until they find each other. Uh, yeah. Exactly, like you have to be Gaussian in order to explore the space. <laughs> That's true. So, uh, otherwise, you will yeah. never I, meet. But I the chances of meeting is higher if you do this kind of random work. So probably for multi-agent stuff, this would be better than just following the gradient. I don't know. <laughs> when well, the agents I, have to I, I don't know that I would say RDMs or forward forward follow the gradient. No, I mean, um, I don't know if I care to it. No, this is a, this is exactly modeling the gradient, and the methods are established. Um, we know what they do. It's yeah, not that we don't know what RDM does, but yeah. It's kind of clear here what happens even when you sample just one sample. Yeah, yeah I mean, it is. Great. Yeah. But the chances of being, what are the chances of being in the cone of general direction with the actual gradient the high, in the high dimensional spaces? The, um, well, it always be within the cone. The only problem is that it might be too close to the edges of those cones. But yeah, as you can see, they can see. Oh, because it will be negative. If yeah, you're outside yeah. of the corn, it will be negative. Okay, yes. Yeah. 
This is the cone, this, as you can see, all blue lines, which are all gradients are within this cone, despite the fact that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of like for the silly question. No? When it's outside, it will be negative. When it, when it kind of points out this direction, the forward gradient, forward derivative will be negative. And so it go there. So, yeah, I think I covered all. Oh, one last thing I wanted to do is do a little calculation. So the maximum number of weights here at 100 layers is 100 times the size of linear uh, linear layer they're using. So it's around 100, 100 million parameters. It should be enough, but still they didn't explore billions of parameters and that's the domain of large language models. Uh, and then here, uh, uh, Brad, uh, in a moment, I don't hear any uh, cries of pain when you hear <laughs> you still didn't explore large models. Are you not listening? <laughs> I was expecting you to start moaning, like, oh, I'm, <laughs> you didn't explore large models, guys. This is the reviewers. Uh, I thought I won't have that. Yeah. <laughs> or you got over it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's always the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what, no, but what's the maximum size of activation uh, here of the uh, single layer? And this is MLP, right? 24. 24. Yeah, that's that's not, yeah, that's tiny. Um, um, I think the un, untold advantage of this method uh, that of uh, doing forward AD uh, is that not just the speed but also the memory once you like once you've done the computation you already have your forward uh, gradient and then you can get rid of everything fast and uh, especially in the networks that they have explored and so you can compute in a loop uh, you know the uh, what is it called like an iterative optimization like a tail recursion optimization kind of stuff you don't need to keep the entire track of what you've computed with back propagation you will have to keep up every activation on the path to the end of the function with here once you reach the end you have the gradient and you you can compute it if you get the loss or you can keep it you know until you get the loss or something like that for the Huge settings. You would memory. still probably throw it out, right? Just like in the forward AD. Then you do checkpoints and you have to recompute, recompute, recompute. Here you don't have to recompute, you compute everything once, including the gradients by throwing out everything. Yeah, that's what I mean. You you throw them out after you compute them. So you compute them in the forward pass, throw out the ones that you've already applied. Yeah. Forward. Yeah. Well, no, actually no. No. You throw out the activations, you do not throw out the gradients, you will need that number with respect to loss. You need to get all the way to the loss function to apply them. You cannot apply them because you need the gradient with respect to loss. The gradients that you're computing are not with respect to loss yet because you don't know the you don't know the final uh, anything like you, the values. So. That's the, not the values, activation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can also see that the memory usage stays the same. So I'm not sure. What is memory? This one. Yeah, but what memory usage are they floating? The entire process? I'm not I'm not talking about the entire process. I'm talking that within the process you can minimize the memory possibly by uh yeah actually you do not need the activations uh, or the derivative with uh, with respect to like you don't need the joints the joints can be large uh you just keep the gradients until you, you get the end so if your network has 100 layers uh probably you can save memory uh more, more much more than just Hundred layers times two, because of the activations that you have to keep for uh, back propagation. Here, times two will be times number of 
uh, the size that the parameters are, are combined. And yes, the, you will need that for the gradient anyways. But for backpropagation, you will also need additional memory for keeping all the activations. And if your activations are huge, volumetric convolutional neural network with a few filters, then uh, you're wasting a lot more memory in backward in the backpropagation, uh, a very small DD than with the just my two cents on that. Like pro probably there is benefit not just in speed that can be explored with this. Yeah, any, any other question? Is this being used in any applications so far within theory right now? I haven't seen them, but I saw, saw a few presentations of this on the end. I think I'll message you about a circuit, but I, I was interested in seeing that you know, if there are models that are you know emulating these kind of you know, greedy biological organism style learning that you see in the slime molds and uh, you, know, you talk about bacteria and other things. So it's a very promising style of learning that's uh, it's good for specific kinds of problems, uh, works very well. Uh, so I'd be interested to see if that, if that it could be modeled to. And uh, network growth and stuff. Yeah, yeah for biological prob like problems, right? Or oh, biology, biology inspired uh, problems. Yeah, I mean, that would be the first thing. And then you have to think about how you can use that to you know, design a few more interesting learning algorithms. I think we could go to the school to have some like, based on flights, right? Possibly. Do you, can you elaborate on? Uh, so here, I think I uh, have uh, built models based on flight, the way of flight, because uh, you can figure out all the neurons uh, on a small flight. And so basically, they tried to do it, uh, replicate that. Uh, without obvious data on bacteria and other temporary stuff, but just the, the, the basics. And they found out that it was very really sample efficient, but uh, it converged to like poor solution. Also oh, so biased. Yeah. That was like pretty sample efficient. Well, if you can compute the true gradient, it makes all sense to go in the true gradient direction. Uh, especially in those smooth surfaces that we have, but I also wonder when the surfaces are rough, like there is a, a lot of noise. They're sort of over overall convex, but there is a lot of noise here. Uh, you can do momentum, large st steps, and stuff like that. But maybe AD forward mode uh, handles that already because it's all it's like overly stochastic, going random directions and things like that. I wonder if it's better. Deals with local minima that is GT without momentum or without any uh, second uh, order tricks. I don't know. So uh, I have a comment on this. In general, if you whenever you're doing your back propagation in earth, when in like the so the normal algorithm, yeah, we do the forward propagation first and then of course the back propagation. In general, the forward propagation takes less time than backward propagation because in the back you, you have to calculate the gradients. And that, in general, in any, then you, you will have to calculate the gradients and the and all those things. So that takes a lot of time. My, uh, what, what I am confused about this part is like, first of all, you don't really know which direction you need to go to because. In the case of back propagation, you at least have some idea or the not well, good idea with respect to the batch. But with respect to the batch, but in this case, you will still have to explore each and every random uh, direction. And mm -hmm. then, no. no, the beauty of this is that uh, each random vector is giving you some correct direction. So, on average, you will be moving in the right direction. Oh, in average, you will be moving in the right direction. Okay. And do we need to save the number of directions to check? You could, but if you make this algorithm slows, it will become as slow as the propagation. Well, I think it was slower, but then. No, how many directions it will check? 
и вот конец. А вот directions получаем body pull. Just one. One. So I think stochastic uh, nature of like SGD helps here. Because anyway, if we are computing exact gradient with respect to incorrect objective function, which is our loss on a batch, it's not what we want. We want our loss on the entire data set. That is the correct direction to go. But we're kind of like, ah, whatever. And this is kind of like, whatever. Uh, then, then as then long as it's in the right direction, we're just going there. Like, my friendly bacteria, but very is learning, right? So we always are supposed to follow the incorrect because it is learning process. We cannot have the correct loss in advance. We can if we use yeah, batch we method. If we use all data. Yeah. 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 If we use all data, that's the best that you descend yeah. yeah. But we it's just impossible. And loss convergence uh, is probably faster when you do SGD. Mm -hmm. That's this Leo Butu uh, test of time award paper uh, from New Lips 2018. If like, like, well, the paper is 10 years, so it's from uh, 2008. But the test of time was 2018. That's where they show it uh, that convergence rate is faster for SGD. So I guess since uh, you said we kind of showed with the formulas with the um, expected value, showing that this is an unbiased estimator of the gradient, does that mean that it has the same convergence rate as the past gradient or? Mm, I don't think those statements are connected, uh, the convergence rate, but yeah. it's more stochastic than stochastic. <laughs> it adds, adds stochasticity on top of SGT by also working sort of in the cone, but not in the right direction. The, the, the trick here, and I, it took me some time uh, to understand, not with respect to this paper, but with respect to life, <laughs> is that when you're optimizing a wrong objective, you know it's wrong. There is no point in wasting a lot of effort to getting this wrong objective right. Get it somewhat right and move on to the next task. But, and then that, that's what it does. Uh, uh, maybe if they're right with their experiment, maybe optimizing on each batch, the correct gradient with respect to this batch is as wrong or as stochastic as optimized uh, of doing this, just going within the column with respect to the uh, actual direction. What we need to do is do the batch updates, start with a point, compute the gradient with respect to the entire data set, and then compute to the gradient with, to, with respect to a random sample, and compute this random direction with respect to a random sample. And then see how much each of them corresponds to the actual gradient uh, uh, once you go the, with respect to the entire data set. Probably, well, still that prop should be better. It, it's going there more determined, but coming there later. Uh, not always, but. Uh, please. They show that the performance of back of backward AD versus this is the same, right? No, no, they don't. I can't see. Well, that is the one that the performance. What do you mean by Can you show that last plot? The last one. See the middle one? Yeah. It's the ratio, one over another. Okay. So when it's one, it's the same. When it's smaller, this is fat, like faster. So it's starts with being uh, slightly worse than twice uh, on the left and then goes to be just 20%, 10% faster or 15% faster. And 15%, you can just go get some coffee and, and spend this two weeks uh, just drinking your coffee while you're a month long training model or like one year long training, still trains. You can pitch it to OpenAI. I'm sure they four weeks. I'm say. sure they know this anyway. Wow. So, yeah, they may be using it in some cases. It, they probably just throw more GPUs at it. Every time they have a new sample, they just everything's faster. You just have the GPU. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Alvin. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, GPT five. <laughs> oh, GPT five actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eventually.
So be careful what you say, especially on the record. It will be analyzed and used as training data. <laughs> <laughs> and then regurgitated to somebody right. innocent as an answer. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Pavel. Uh, I don't know, we have still a couple of minutes, five minutes for last questions. If anyone has any more questions uh, or comments uh, or comments of this sort, we don't want to see any anything like that ever again, or we want more of that, or like what's, what's the uh, conclusion? Um, I'm interested in seeing if this has been applied successfully to things outside of just making deep learning faster. That would be the interesting thing. Yeah, well, faster and memory efficient. My goal is memory efficient, but uh, my implementation kind of it sucks currently. Uh, so I need to fix the implementation. Um, or I'm looking for a volunteer. Pavel was sort of volunteer. That's how you got to this paper, right? But it got you too much of, of, of truck. Or I volunteered, volunteered you, right, to do it. Uh, I forgot you were, <clears throat> you were speaking about it. Um, well, but I got yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got I gave you the code list. That's how this forward, forward. That's how I called the method. Yeah, but I thought it's another forward, forward. No, no, that I, this one I would just throw at Noah and close the door quick. <laughs> yeah, it's just my name because uh, in Python you call methods forward and backward. How do you call this forward mode idea? And like it, but it's just forward, forward. Uh, that's why I call it dreadful country. Okay, thanks everyone. We're just chatting here. We will be done in three minutes. If you want and you're in the building, just step into ATN03 and I'll see you next week. Um, please check the schedule for who is presenting next week. Uh, people are like, bye bye. And Mr.